Little of the 13th Dark Founding was spared Imperial censors, and the Umbral raids were no exception. Almost all information on the chapter comes from the inhabitants of worlds they've saved or interactions they've had with other chapters. Across the centuries since their founding, the Inquisition has launched several investigations into the Umbral raids. These investigations were meant to probe into the chapter's methods and motives. However, most have ended in dead ends and cold cases. The most conclusive and successful of these reports comes from the 39th millennium. Previous to that were several dated and contradictory records from the 36th millennium. What is known is that the Umbral Wraiths are a fleet-based successor chapter that patrols the fringes of Imperial space. To this day, neither their purpose nor even their Primarch is well documented or widely known. In truth, almost entirely redacted and hidden to most, the Umbral Wraiths were initially created as experimental and versatile Xenus hunting Astartes chapter. Like the Exorcists and Ordo Malleus, the raids were meant to aid Death Watch and the Ordo Xenus in their quest to defend the Imperium from the Xenus threat. Where they were to patrol the borders of Imperial space from Xenus incursion, the Umbral raids were to dive into their territory and act as both scout and vanguard. The chapter was to be made of Dark Angels and Ravenguard gene seed. However, the Ravenguard genetic material was too unstable and precious for such an experiment, especially with the Death Spectres produced within the same founding. As a result, the Umbral Wraiths were given... Oh, redacted. Order of the Inquisition. Interesting. <clears throat> uh, were given... something under the authority of high-ranking Inquisitors in the Order Xenus. Initially, the Umbral Wraiths were meant to creep through the void and devastate targets, not unlike the Xeno species many believe the chapter was named after. Despite their thick tension with the Inquisition now, the Umbral Wraiths were designed to be a transcendent tool in hunting Xenus and reinforcing the reach and might of the Order's chamber militant, Death Watch. Moreover, the chapter was to scout and harass the enemies of humanity deep within their own territory. If they could not reclaim worlds, they could at least grant the weakening Imperium a slight reprieve. Due partly to their heavily classified nature, none, save the highest agents in the Inquisition's Ordo Xenus, knew how successful they were in their initial release onto the galaxy. The few recovered documents indicate they have had several shrouded but useful figures within the Watch. Moreover, they were supposedly a diverse information-gathering web for the Ordo Xenus until M38, when all reports stopped. Despite that silence, it is known the chapter still operates and exerts its information-gathering skills. They have retained their loyalty to the Imperium, that much is still certain, as they seem to be seeking and eliminating any foe within its grasp. Yet, they do not respond to the Inquisition unless there is a threat of excommunicate traitores. A later report in M40 discusses the propositions of a rising Inquisitor investigating the raids for the Ordo Xenus soon after his confirmed transfer to the Ordo Hereticus, a quote-unquote parting gift before his leave. It is unclear how correct the report's claims are, however, they are, as a whole, more reliable than the previous most cited information on the matter of the raids. Since their creation in the 13th founding, these Ordo Startes have wandered through the fringes of Imperial space. Even compared to the Dark Angels, they are particularly aloof, barely leaving a recorded presence. However, as the Great Rift opened, they shifted their vigil from Imperial Space's edges to the Rift's borders. Currently, they're patrolling the Imperial Nihilus around their main recruitment world, Palatine. Palatine lies between the north of Baal and Valhalla, and is a shrine world that has faced most of all the Imperium's enemies on more than one occasion. Orc wars, necro invasions, and, of course, demonic and chaos incursions. Without rest, they have been attempting to hold back whatever corrupt threats they can. At the end of the day, however, they are but one chapter. While they have broken numerous chaotic warbands apart and fended off several Xenus incursions, even their reach is limited. As a fleet-based chapter, the Umbral Raid's Fortress Ministry and flagship are one and the same. However, this vessel is no standard battle barge. Some time ago, the Umbral Wraiths, amidst the lonely stars of deep space, were given by the Emperor, or perhaps the Omnissiah, their venerated mobile fortress ministry, an abandoned space hulk from the Dark Age of Technology. As it drifted in the depths of space, infested from brim to stern with scum and villainy, the Umbral Wraiths perched the vessel and reclaimed its venerable halls. Dubbed the Dark Cathedral, this space hulk was once a proud mining vessel. It would chase and break down asteroids and other celestial bodies in its gloried past to bring its bounty back to its homeworld. 
It contains several powerful industrial technologies that give the chapter efficient means to self-repair. Moreover, within its ancient halls were numerous exo-armor suits, once used for mining, but now requisitioned as tactical dreadnought armor for the sole purpose of conducting war. This Goliath's mighty hull is covered in rock and debris from its long drifting sleep within the void, where others might have seen this as a sign of age or a blemish, a reminder of humanity's struggle, the Red Sea but another gift. The hallowed halls grow silent as the lights dim and darken when all unimportant systems are powered down and minimized, showing only these stones and rocks clinging to its hull. With the lowered power output, the blessed battleship looks like nothing but a lowly remnant of humanity's past. Unsuspecting and inconspicuous, the raids use this deception to lure in or slip past foes' sights and into the rear of enemy formations. From this ruse, the chapter gun and gunships tear apart enemy fleets and transports before they can react. Critical to understanding the Umbral Raid's organizational structure is knowing how different they operate versus other fleet-based chapters. Unlike their star-sailing brethren, the Raids never stray too far from the Dark Cathedral and continuously work in web-like formations spanning no more than a few systems or sectors. This hesitation to extend a distance comes from their past experiences, most notably the chapter's bloodiest night, a day that marked the loss of their chapter master and most of their second company. As such, the Umbral Raids under Chapter Master Labinus strive to remain within reach of each other at all times, ever wary of being caught out again, and are more cooperative and codependent than most other fleet-based chapters. After joining together with their Primaris reinforcements post the Eternal Night, the Umbral Raids once again reorganize to incorporate their new battle brothers into their recently wounded but hardened ranks. Unfortunately, this did them no favors with the inner circle of the Unforgiven chapters. Herein, however, lies a vast departure from many of their brother chapters. The Umbral Raids companies, post the first and excluding the tenth, all contain five veterans on loan from the first to serve as command staff and elites. Conversely, the first company is just 60 marines strong. These remaining marines, the Umbral Guardians, are the most elite of the chapter and are charged with protecting the Fortress Ministry, the Dark Cathedral, and its high-ranking officials, such as Chapter Master Labinus, High Interrogator Emil, and High Librarian Octavius. These guardians and their wards also serve as versatile and elite forces worth their weight in Xenoblood, even in their diminished numbers. Many gridlocked and losing battles have been turned once the guardians were given reign over the battlefield, safely relieved of their charges. Furthermore, there exists an ancient, and some might even say antiquated, tradition within the Umbral Wraiths. Each Wraith Brother of the chapter is entitled to two of the many serfs within the Venerable Dark Cathedral to serve as their personal assistants. These chapter serfs serve as aides to their Wraith regardless of the position they hold, extending even to the highest order of chapter command. From helping maintain war gear, performing rites, and other such municipal tasks, to coordinating chapter rituals and carrying their master's will, these serfs carry the weight of their rates as extensions of their will. In particular, the servants of chapter command are given complementary roles among the serfs of the chapter, such as high interrogator serf maintaining order and coordination within the reclusium. To that end, however, Umbral Wraith Chapter Command and other important figures also have the right to claim an equerry within the chapter. These equerry are full-fledged Wraith Brothers, typically in fields related to the commander's own field of influence or duty, who serve as additional aides and confidants. Such brothers are considered to be the established second in command of these heroes, and should the worst come to pass, we lacked in their stead until a replacement is found. While many chapters tend to distance themselves from their tech marines and masters of the forge, especially the Dark Angels, the Umbral Raids have had increasingly troubled relations with the Mars Mechanicum. It treasures its tech marines and local forge world Mechanicum branches. This trust and this endearment are not unrequited, however. Where other tech marines feel dual loyalties to the Mechanicum and their chapter, the edicts of the Umbral Raids and their trust lead these tech marines to commit to their chapter first and that of the Forge World within their vigil, not to the Priest of Mars. To many of these marines, the Umbral Raids and Unforgiven are one of, if not the last, of the Emperor's children to seek out science and reason over zeal and faith. Thus, Serving the Umbral Raids, Exotor and Octavius served as the Omnissiah sincerely willed it, not as the haggard hoarders of Mars envision it.
The Sepulchrias, a strange command structure within the raids, is made of the chapter's ancients and serves as a basis of its hierarchy and serves chapters in a circle. All raids that intend to enter the wider chain of command progress through the Sepulchrias as minor figures, proving themselves and gaining more of the chapter's trust and their ancient ancestral history. Eventually, through their displays of loyalty and exemplary service or dedication to the chapter's teachings, they establish their final role within the chapter and its many stations. It is within this central network that company masters learn of their posts' weight, that chaplains learn the righteous wrath of the chapter, and the librarians learn the dangers of their power. Those who remain closer to the several carriers than other organizations within the chapter, however, remain as chapter and company ancients. These ancients, however, are not simply the bannermen and keepers of the other Astartes chapters. Rather distinctly, the Umbral Raids have expanded the role past recounting events and heroes or announcing the glories of a formation to remind the living of their dead and serve as a monument to their brotherhood. Within the halls of the Sepulchrias and on the field of battle, in equal measure, these storied keepers record every Wraith brother and their deeds in tomes and scriptures in the hopes of keeping their memory alive within the halls of the Dark Cathedral. From tales of excellence to mementos, ornaments, and even the bones and remains of these heroes, the Wraiths and their memory are honored within the silent statue-lined walls of the Sepulchre and the chapter's most precious relic, the Chronicle of Champions. This text, kept safe since the chapter's very inception, recounts the epic deeds, finest moments and most storied sagas of the chapter. These heirlooms crafted and kept by the several carriers with the chapter's host of relics serve as the basis for many chapter rites. Most notable of these rituals and rites are the rites of remembrance. The ancient rites of remembrance attempt to stoke and stir the spirits of their fallen from wherever they may lie and grant the living the power to remind their foes of both their dead deeds and righteous anger. Such rites are both the charge of both company ancients and chaplains, as both posts demand the living look to the future, but never forget the past. While ancients remember the deeds of such mighty and inspire raids to reach similar heights, chaplains chant litanies in praise to honor their dead, call for new heroes to take their place. To recover a raid's body, especially one of a venerable rank or role, such as an umbral guardian's, is a deep and guttural priority to all umbral raids. More than any other chapter, the umbral raids value and demand the recovery of their dead beyond just their gene seed and progenoid glands. To them, it is more than a matter of the chapter's physical survival, but of their very spirit and souls. Once recovered, enshrined and entombed, these rites of remembrance attempt to recall the dead and bolster the living. More than that, however, they try to summon their honored dead spirits and borrow their prowess in the recollection of such deeds. Often the most celebrated exploits require either sacrifice and offering from the enemy or channeling through the remains of their honored heroes. Upon completion, the wraith seems to move in haunting silence as though they were the hero of old, or gain a sense of prowess they did not possess moments ago. Be it greater swordsmanship, improved accuracy, or even sorcerers, but straightforward increases to speed or strength, such effects, however, are short-lived as the dead are gone, and even in their brotherhood cannot stay in the material forever. The Chamber of the Reclusium, responsible for ensuring loyalty and purity among the torrent of lies, xenos, heretics and the fallen, might spit. The office executes the chapter's justice in accordance to chapter law. Through the guidance of chaplains and order of the Kormas, a special rank and position within the chapter, the umbral rates are kept pure. As members of the Unforgiven, this is paramount, for even the smallest chink in their armor of reason, faith, and loyalty can lead to untold consequences spreading throughout the chapter. Every member of the Reclusium is expected to be a stalwart beacon of guidance or justice and paragons of the chapter's edicts. This method of leading by example is embodied by none better than the current High Interrogator, Emil. Having been among the chapter's inner circle and highest offices since even Chapter Master Labinus's induction into the chapter as a neophyte, High Interrogator Emil carries with him both confidence and care for his brothers through his duties, inspiring kinship and resolve. He is still an interrogator of the Unforgiven, however, and while those loyal are blessed with safety and comfort in his gaze, those with darker secrets and resting thoughts of heresy find his gaze shaking 
and crippling. To this end, every company of the Umbral Raids carries both a chaplain and interrogator chaplain, one to inspire and one to intimidate, so that each battle brother is able to weather the stress of endless war and storms of lies they will face in turn. The Cormors are a specialist rank and trial given to those entering the sepulchrias and chapters in a circle. It is their duty to silently listen, learn and execute the chapter's traditions. This duty includes carrying out the Guardmaster's orders and dispensing justice on those Marines deemed to have betrayed the chapter, should such treasons arise in the hunt for the Fallen. Moreover, through their stoic deeds, they are to prove themselves unbreakable under the weight of duty. Those who pass are passed on to the positions that best fit them. Often such beacons are made into chaplains and interrogator chaplains, while those who are worthy but unsuited to the role are made ancients and champions to continue to remember and uphold the chapter's honor. Those seem to possess the qualities of leadership and tactical flexibility, in so far as it does not betray their oaths, are made lieutenants and company masters. Failures, meanwhile, are kept under charge of their interrogated chaplains to be sent into the front of each battle, where they will die in the name of the chapter, honor intact, or centuries later, learn the truth they were once not ready to hear. Similar to the apothecarians of most chapters, the Umbral Raids carry one large exception, the Undertakers. Formed from the chapter serfs within the Space Hulk, or those with the spirit, but not the body meant for chapter initiation, they operate under the Tenth and Eighth Company as gods of the Dark Cathedral. This internal police force, for and off chapter serfs, fall under the ultimate command of the Guardmaster and his Cormors. However, all of their duties, the most prestigious of them, is the protection and escort of the chapter's apothecaries. This all-important duty is reserved exclusively for a select few recruits among the Undertakers who passed initial neophyte screening, but failed to make it to gene seed implementation. These special recruits, the Ghasts, may not have made it to the rank and status of Shade, but they are elite and valiant forces ready to give their lives to the chapter despite their failure. The Ghasts serve on the field as the personal forces of Chapter's apothecaries, defending and escorting gene seed and progenoid glands as ordered and without heed of their own safety. Their skill and valiant loyalty to the Chapter make them suited to the job as with their expert training, but lack of augmentation, casualties they suffer only minimize lost gene seed, compared to furthering the losses of their surrounding Wraith brothers. This current practice was started by High Apothecary Elitha after his life, and the genetic material of his brothers was saved by a valiant guardsman in a battle against Orkish commandos. Long ago, when he served the Fifth Company, Elitha had been assailed from behind by several orcs while extracting his fallen brother's progenoid glands. Death seemed imminent for him and a generation of raids, if not for a lone savior. A single guardsman of the local regiment leaped onto the orc's back before the greenskin could bring down its slag metal axe onto Elitha. Rapidly and repeatedly stinging the sizable green monster with his combat knife, the commando let out a bellow of pain, or maybe joyous pleasure, before attempting to grab the mortal off his shoulders. Its toothy mouth roared out, and the soldier lobbed a belt of grenades into its gut and awaited for its detonation, determined to save one of his angels, even if it meant the end of his own life. Before they could, Elitha leaped into action. Slamming the greenskin's mouth shut with an uppercut, Elitha reached over the Xena's shoulder, grabbing the man and spinning back on his heel, holding his hero and the progenoid glance close and shielding them with his own power-armored body. As a grenade belt detonated, killing the orc, Elitha and the line trooper withdrew back to his wraith brothers and the trenches. Within the bowels of the dark cathedral, in smoke and smog, master artisans of the chapter work tirelessly to mend metal and forge ferocious weapons of war. Led by high processionary Exitor, the countless artisans and artifices of the chapter are rotated tirelessly in order to keep production at its maximum capacity. Numerous chapter serves, taught by the ancient brothers of the armory how to make, maintain, and refine their charges, work in unison until they time the end of their work cycle and the next swarm takes their place. As high processionary, Exeter is also responsible for the oversight of the chapter's dreadnoughts and their care. 
often deployed to the battlefield with them while his equerry rules in his place, Exodor brings the might of Martian training, unforgiven heart, and the wrath of the Umbral Wraiths to bear as he defends his mighty ward from ages past. Before the Great Rift opened, the Umbral Wraiths were a vanguard force on a single, if not a dual-natured mission. They would wander the edges of the Imperial space, attempting to weaken and cull forces before they could pierce into the Imperium's territories. As such, many other chapters' actions in this long period have gone unnoticed or otherwise unsung. Either the enemy never made it past them, or were ultimately felled by another chapter. When the Great Rift opened, the raids were engaging a small flotilla of Necrons before being swallowed by the rend in space. Caught in the ensuing warp storms and vortexes of the Cicatrix Maledictum as it wrecked across the galaxy, the chapter had barely made it back to the Dark Cathedral in time to escape mass extermination. For the next ten years, they fought from stern to bow against an unyielding tide of lesser and greater demons. Only after Labina slew a mighty and familiar horror of the warp in the hangar of the cathedral in his overtaken rage, a surge of zealous faith washed over the remaining umbral wraiths, and their flagship was able to stir itself from the warp's immaterial grip. They raced back to Palatine without delay nor rest, only to find it besieged by chaotic bands of night lords. At that moment, the Astartes lamented. It seemed as if the world they held so dear the world many called home would be lost forever. It was silent on the ship, a morning silence that seemed unbreakable, until the vox sounded. A strange group of marines on the surface, proud in the Umbral Wraith's colors, hailed them for reinforcements. As the bridge held its breath in amazement, wonder and confusion, all in equal measure, their hesitation was cut by Labinus standing tall and commanding a forward rush into the Night Lord's fleet. As he roared his orders, his brothers could feel their chapter master's faith, valor, and, of course, his relief wash over them. Then, spurred on by Emil, the chapter rushed forward with a speed and precision that seemed fantastical, like a lucid dream even to other Astartes. The mighty third company broke apart the enemy flagship from within, while the second company scoured the ground forces, whilst the fourth and fifth secured flanks and recaptured ground assets. With the full might of the chapter, even as wounded as it was, the warband was quickly annihilated. Since their introduction to the chapter, the Umbral Wraiths have been quicker than many other Unforgiven to accept their new siblings. This acceptance was founded in their existing veneration for the dead and fighting forces of the Imperium. While many within chapter command were weary of Gilliman's new scions, their deeds won them over and eventually led to their induction into the depleted third and second companies. Chapter Master Labinus himself spoke out loudly in the defense of the Primaris during several meetings, much to the ire of the Unforgiven. Eventually, as the Supreme Grand Master decreed, Primaris were inducted and the Umbral Wraiths vindicated for their trust. High Librarian Octavius himself would cross the Rubicon Primaris in order to better aid in the transition as the newer Marines were inducted into the chapter's command structure. It is not uncommon for the Umbral Wraiths to gather neophytes from worlds they've saved or served. After any engagement, either world soldiery or perhaps some selected candidates impress Chapter Command and the Apothecarian, a meeting is held on their worth. Such nominations will be given a choice on whether or not they will present themselves to the Emperor and his Wraiths. This practice has been exercised for a fair few raids, most notably the High Librarian Octavius, High Processionary Exitor, High Interrogator Emil, and even Chapter Master Labinus. Currently, however, the Umbral Raids maintain three recruitment worlds, Palatine, Casbar, and Infrangible. The large majority of Umbral Wraith neophytes come from the mountainous mining world of Casbar and flat-stepped plains of the shrine world Palatine. In contrast, a rare few come from the cemetery world of Infrangible. Strangely, however, many other chapter's veterans throughout the years have hailed from Infrangible, such as the current keeper of the sepulchre, Dimitri. That said, since the adoption and integration of the Dark Cathedral, the chapter also maintains its own regiment of chapter serfs within the Space Hulk in an almost city-like community. This internal servant colony runs the large flagship and helps keep it operational and in peak condition for the chapter, while bolstering their forces with suitable shades and recruits. This internal recruitment accounts for approximately a third of the chapter's marines and serves as a basis for its own auxiliary forces, the Undertakers, 
normally trained to peak performance and are expected to meet or exceed the capabilities of Tempestus Science in order to effectively deploy alongside the chapter. This intense training is often alongside marine neophytes and even includes joint drills to encourage cooperation and brotherhood further. This high skill level is seen as recruitment to compensate for their limited experience and war gear compared to officially sanctioned forces such as the very Tempestus Science they are meant to emulate. Recently, however, these undertakers have seen an increase to their numbers, as since the opening of the Great Rift, the desperation and danger within Nihilus has pushed the chapter to previously unprecedented course of action dangerously close to repeating the mistakes of M41. As of year 020, M42, Chapter Master Labinus has lifted his long-standing edict limiting the chapter's deployment ranges. To supplement the extended range of the chapter, recruitment for both the Undertakers and Chapter's Marines has also been lifted past the limits of the Codex Astartes. Over the past few decades, the Umbral Raids have been maximizing the numbers of Marines possible and leaving their newer, greener squads in reserved positions along various relay stations in their area of space. These stations, which are in principle similar to those of the Death Watch, relay orders, information, supplies and rapid strike forces from system to system so that major strike forces may focus on larger threats. Currently, the Undertakers number 370,000 auxiliary forces distributed among various worlds, relay stations and strategic locations within Wraith-protected space. This expanded force of auxiliary is dedicated to supporting local worlds and the recently established relay stations of the chapter. Central to the Umbral Raids is an occult reverence for the fallen heroes of mankind deeply instilled into them from even their gene seed implementation. It is primarily to blame for their strained relations with most branches of the Imperial War Machine. Untold numbers of Astro Militarum Guardsmen report feeling an unnatural sense of gloom and dread radiating around the chapter's marines, an all-imposing anxiety that only seems to be overpowered by the relief, awe and wonder of seeing his angels of death in open combat. To the Astro Militarum's credit, however, the Umbral Raids are, in complete fairness, often distant and apathetic to most non-military positions within the Imperium. These positions, while important as a whole, are seen as secondary to that of Imperium soldiery, as without the fighting forces of humanity, there would be no space left to harbor mankind in the harsh galaxy they find themselves in. To this end, while the Umbral Raids seek to minimize casualties and collateral, it is less a sense of love and more duty that leads them to this end. Moreover, while the chapter respects the Militarum and its guardsmen for braving the front lines and holding firm, it holds little respect for the scared civilians behind them. To these Marines, who frequently employ fear tactics, subterfuge and are his bulwark against terror, the fear mortal men feel in the face of invasion is but grounds for disgust and disdain in the worst cases. This reverence does not stop with the chapter's own brothers either, extending out to the droves of guardsmen that have died holding lines and biding time as well as the other chapters and the untold number of the Imperium's fighting forces. It has been documented that the Umbral Raids record in great detail, almost comparable to their own records, the names and acts of many other Imperial agents and revere them as often. On one such example, several guardsmen reported the Umbral Raids giving a prayer to the remainder of Acadia's guardsmen. Similarly, seven orders of the Adeptus Sororitas, despite strained relations within the chapter, report their veneration for the various saints of the order and even more recent and local figures. While the Dark Angel's significant and stable genes acted as the perfect counter to their other gene seeds' few weaknesses, the combination of the Lion's genetic material and, um, the thing redacted by the Order of the Inquisition, a gene seed seems to have created some unintentional effects. After successful gene seed implementation, specifically on the Suzanne membrane, neophytes are left in lung comas. During these periods, which was once thought to be an accidental activation of the membrane, all Wraith neophytes dream of their fallen brother recruits. Such neophytes emerge with deep and impossibly vast knowledge of those who died at their side, from the childhood of men from across their homeworld to the intimate secrets of failed recruits born planets away. Many of the chapter's librarians have since speculated this is a strange inversion of the famed Redacted Order of the Inquisition likely resulting from the classified gene mixture. 
This speculation comes from the fact that many raids, especially the shipboarding Reaver squads of the third company, report a similar effect whenever they utilize their eighth gene seed organ, the Omophagia. Such reports detail not only the memory of those whose flesh they've consumed, but also their thoughts, feelings, and their plans for the near future. The eye sclera is made deep black, but their iris turns a vivid and bright color of a lightened and white-tinted hue of their standard eye color. This, coupled with their skin becoming pale but not albino, and their veins popping outward with an unsettling clarity in their strength and growth, give the chapter a notably undead appearance. This is only spurred by the chapter's failed gene seed implants becoming thin and brittle, as if drained of strength. Those who look on such failures remark that they seem almost skeletal and ancient, despite being only a few days old. Primarily unknown to all but the most expert psychers and the Raid's librarians is the effect their dual-natured gene seed has on the Umbral Raid's souls. The souls of the Umbral Raids leave a signature trace in the warp distinctly different from other humans and space marines. Often remarked as a strange veil of confusion or darkness where one's very soul should be, it makes them hard to notice via the warp and such otherworldly senses. It is not as if their souls are invisible in the warp, but more as if they melt into the background of their psychic surroundings. As such, they are difficult to contact astropathically and, more often than not, expose allied astropaths to longer and more dangerous depths into the warp. Conversely, this distinct signature is effortless to detect when one already knows what they are looking for. Experts in the warp and dedicated hunters find the raid souls like beacons in the dark instead of cloaked daggers. While the details of the chapter's combat doctrine varies widely from company to company, above all it values the core concepts of striking swiftly and brutally at critical points in enemy combat formations and structures. Even more static formations of the raids revolve around weathering enemy fire in order to create and exploit openings within the enemy. This silent and brutal efficiency, reminiscent of the Raven God, is often seen as low casualty and might lead one to underestimate the lengths to which the chapter will go. However, it has been well documented, or at least by the standard of what is documented about the chapter, that the raids are not against crippling high-risk operations against the enemy. A staple of this is their signature but daring method of infiltrating enemy flagships. Exploiting the nature of most conventional shielding and defensive arrays, the Umbral Raids have taken to deploying third company Reavers on EVA, extra vehicle activity, otherwise known as spacewalks, insertions with the aid of their grapnel launchers, grav shoots, and extensive calculations. These maneuvers, no matter how practiced and prepared, are invariably risky ventures. Even in the pressurized armor, the dangers of such void jumps are well above the standard threshold of what could be considered safe. The return to these insertions yield, however, is a prime example of the chapter's lateral thinking and paralyzing effectiveness. Through these jumps, successful contact with enemy ship hulls allows for the manual sabotage of enemy point defense systems with the detonation of plasma and melter charges across the hull and defense batteries. Other instances see the deployment of teleport homers to call their firstborn brothers onto or into the enemy vessel in order to tear apart the enemy's ranks from within. Once documented case managed to recover the security footage of traitor forces at the edge of the system. The haunting footage showed the extensive master of fear tactics Umbral Wraith Reavers employ in their interrogation and the unreserved use of their omophagia to learn vessel layouts and weaknesses before clearing it from stern to bow as Terminator squads clear the hangar and larger areas. Throughout the millennia of their existence, the Umbral Raids commonly utilize Mark VI and VII armor interchangeably and, in some cases, even mixing single suits. However, despite not being a part of the Great Crusade themselves, they have also been documented wearing armor parts similar to Mark III and IV. Whether this is a simple, if not intricate choice in design by the Forge Worlds and artifices, or a hint into their founding secrets, only they know for sure. In more recent years, however, as the new Primaris Marines have become more prevalent and gained more prestigious positions within the chapter, innovations have been made in their supply lines. Several key Forge Worlds, given the task of maintaining Umbral Wraith war gear, have been extended the task to upkeep the new Mark X patterns of armor. However, some have noted these productions bear strange choices in artifice. 
The most striking example of this is among the Umbral Sentinels of the First Company, whose armor has been forged in similar design and patterns to old pre-Heresy Mark III and IV. This change in design, even if only superficial, would require advanced artifice on the part of their few Mechanicum allies, which might explain how they've operated for so long with such troubled ties to Mars. The Umbral Raids primarily wear black-colored power armor with secondary components such as gauntlets and pelanes painted gray and highlighted in gold. Their chest is adorned with a gold-colored aquila or imperialis, with a red or bare cloth tabards and cloaks hosting the Umbral Raids sigil over top. Meanwhile, their white and red-colored squad specialty icon stenciled on the right shoulder inset indicates a Battle Brothers assigned troop designation, fire support, close support, battle line, veteran or command. A large black-colored gothic numeral stenciled in the venter of the squad specialist symbol indicates squad assignment. A large white-colored Roman numeral stenciled on the left polane, a knee guard, indicates a Battle Brothers assigned company. The Umbral Raids command staff and veterans are usually distinguished by a skull icons on their helms or special robes and tabards of subtly more ornate embroidery. It is hard to tell apart the company's veterans from their younger brothers to untrained eyes without seeing their blood work unfold. The five veterans of any detachment are granted additional adornments to mark them from the company's own veterans, such as extra markings on their troop designation and engraved laurel wreaths or fur manes on their helms. Conversely, the Umbral Guardians are adorned with special, subtle honors to distinguish them from the other veterans as the chapter's honor guard. All of the Guardians possess a cape dyed a vivid scarlet hue, adorned with a symbolic recounting of their most extraordinary deeds, often with strange aberrations at their center or in place of a wraith. When such an Umbral Guardian dies, in addition to funerary rites and long mourning silences, it is customary to remove and enshrine their skull, no matter its condition, within the cathedral. Their capes are carefully draped over imposing stone pedestals, and their final moments are carved into both the chapter's memory and their rites of remembrance. <laughs>